Hi, I'm Michelle Histand. I'm the Managing Director of Temple University's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Institute. And I am here today with AJ Raju, who we are presenting with the Self-Made and Making Others Award. Now, this award is all about honoring individuals in our community who have become successful entrepreneurs themselves and also empowered others to do so. So AJ, I'm super excited to be with you today. Um, I'm here because we at Temple University want to present you with the Self-Made and Making Others Award. And that is an award that's really all about um, people who have been successful entrepreneurs themselves, but have also enabled success for others, right? So whether that's through job creation or through mentorship or through civic work. And I think you are the perfect person for this because you do all of those things. So really no one better for this award. So I'm really excited to talk to you about it. Thanks for being with me. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So um, I want to start with your philosophy and your belief around leadership and innovation and entrepreneurship um, to sort of ground the conversation. Maybe start there. Well, uh, Michelle, I think all great individuals or companies live at the intersection of three philosophies, Western philosophy, African, philo African philosophy, and Eastern philosophy. Here's what I mean by that. Western philosophy since the time of John Locke goes by the maxim of, uh, I think, therefore I am. It's really big on identity. I'm a podiatrist, I have a medical degree in feet, uh, uh, relying on feet, my knowledge and my experience matter. And the hierarchy uh, goes based on who has the most knowledge, what is your experience, and that identity becomes your prism or your prison through which you view the world. That's the Western philosophy. I think it's very important to have knowledge and experience. That's why your students at Temple you know, are accumulating that degree to gain knowledge and experience. The second philosophy is the African philosophy. There it is, we think, therefore we are. It's more tribal, it's more village-based. I can have knowledge and experience, but I need a team around me if I wanna execute and grow further. So it's collective experience and knowledge, coordinating, collaborating, a village, a tribe. That's a group mindset. And it's very important to have the African philosophy. The Eastern philosophy is where the entrepreneur or the innovator or the creative thinker also lives. There, the maxim is, when I stop thinking, I become. To do that, you have to actively shut off knowledge, shut off identity, shut off experience, and say, instead of imagining the horse running faster, what if it was a car? So that's where the innovation, if you have all three, that intersection, I believe that's, from my standpoint, that's where I think great greatness in organizational level and individual level happens. I love that framework. It reminds me of uh, uh, the hierarchy where as you go up the pyramid, right, it's all about being able to create and to make things happen. Yeah. So that's kind of what you're describing with the, the Eastern side of it. But I think you're right, like all of those coming together, it's like a Venn diagram. Well, I'll give you an Eastern example. So when you think about this pocket square, if I'm Tom Ford, I have knowledge, experience, and my identity is that of a fashion uh, you know, expert mm -hmm. who makes creative uh, pocket squares. But I need a team to mass produce it to make sure that we have an organization and then Tom Ford label, if you're selling at Boyd's or Barney's, more expensive, if you're selling, you know, <laughs> back of your car, less expensive, the team matters, that's the African philosophy. But the Eastern philosophy, Tom Ford will say, does it have to be a pocket square? Why can't it be a pocket round? So this is a pocket round. Can you fundamentally change the question itself and reevaluate the problem? And that's what Eastern philosophy usually thinks about, which is, can we re-examine what the problem is and then shut off the knowledge of it has to be a square and restate all of that and say, what if we looked at it from a completely different angle? If we're creating crops, does it even have to have soil? What about soilless agriculture, right? That's, the, that's where innovators live. I love that. It's getting rid of the, the it has to be this way, right? Which is what we, we often And do. usually that means a two-year-old probably is more likely to innovate Almost than always. somebody who's an expert. That's and right. that's why in an organization, on the African philosophy concept, sometimes your lowest level employee will come up with an innovation or a young person who is, has native fluency in AI and quantum computing and edge computing will tell somebody who is an 80-year-old about things that the 80 year old may have knowledge and experience that can't even imagine because they're reimagining with a blank canvas. So blank canvas is very important.
let me start with your Western philosophy. Let me start with sure. where you started, which is yeah. in law, right? So you went to Temple, you did your undergrad, you became a lawyer. Um, so you started in, in law, and I want to talk about how all of those principles apply to business. But if you can tell us a little bit about, you started in a law firm, and then you started your own law firm, where you practice something called inside-out law. Inside tell us outside. more. Yeah. Uh, so I've always had a corporate practice. You know, we've, we've had clients that have uh, exposure in the U.S., uh, historically, I've also had clients that have operations in Europe and and uh, uh, and Asia, uh, specifically India, um, and so our client pool. We have about what we are uh, inside outside counsel, meaning we have the outside lawyers, which are the Raju lawyers who work out of this building, and then we have our inside lawyers who are also Raju employees, but they're embedded with the client. That's why it's called inside outside. And for our clients, we pretty much serve as the embedded general counsel. We're their embedded counsel. Even if they use multiple firms, we help navigate their legal needs. So collectively, the cohort of clients that we represent, they have a annual legal spend collectively of a little over 30 million. Mm -hmm. But within that cluster of clients, there are clients that are as low as 400,000 a year in legal spend, and there are clients the maximum is 8 million, right? A $8 million client going to a large law firm gets treated a certain way compared to the four, uh, 400000 But together, if they have a $30 million purchase power, then you are the black card holder of American Express and you get treated better at any hotels and resorts. So I explained that for a reason. The one is, what is our role with these clients? We're embedded counsel. That's the inside-outside model. Second is the leverage, uh, leveraging the collective power of all of our clients. So how does that work? We're a very small firm now. I'm no longer with a large platform. So how do I, when our clients have needs all over the country and in cases in Europe as well as in Asia, when I don't have personnel, ge no geographic reach, no personnel reach, as well as no subject matter expertise reach, how do I then solve that problem? I, I looked at Uber for that solution. So what we are is a law firm that has IO partners with partnership with nine other law firms. So a large law firm, one of these law firms, and our firm have a partnership agreement which states in short terms that for the limited purposes of representing these IO clients, law firm X and Raju firm act as one partnership, jointly responsible for the legal services, malpractice, as well as fee sharing, common engagement letter. So we are one firm. We don't own real estate together. You know, they don't have to laugh at my jokes for a bonus. but. When it comes to client service, we're one firm. It's a, so now our headcount, because of this consortium, we're about 1,500 lawyers around the, around the country and, and exposure also in Asian markets as well as Europe. And so we've done it where without owning the car and having the employees as, as drivers, we have our drivers everywhere. That's the IO model. So from a client standpoint, it's the purchasing power being the American Express black card, that's the, the value. From our standpoint, it's the flexibility of being everywhere without actually having ownership in all those places. I, I mean, that's one of the best examples of business model innovation, right, that I can think of. And there, necessity. Well, out of, but look, I mean, you're doing something that we talk about in innovation all the time and in curriculum all the time, which is understanding your customers' needs, right? So you were able to think about what your customers want, what your law firm customers' clients want, right? And, and you're able to meet that by being a small firm. Yeah, and I think that, by the way, starts, it, you, you touched on something. We you talk about the pocket square. Does it have to be a square? Can it be a round? When a client comes in with a problem, it doesn't come in and say, I have a legal problem. It's a problem that has a legal component. It could have a government lobby component, communications component. It could have any component, accounting. Maybe they just want to raise money, this raise of capital. Maybe there are some insolvency issues. They want just help in how to navigate the crisis. So the problems come in different shapes. Normally, you have the electrician, which is the lawyer, the plumber, which is the accounting firm, the you know a construction worker, which is the... Uh, and everybody has to be coordinated. Usually in a kitchen uh, uh, a project like that, you have an architect, you have a design. So the embedded counsel is the architect and the design. And the various elements of law, accounting, government lobby, private equity, venture, we have all of those platforms where I'm the common link. So 215 Capital, Paragon, and all of these companies that I have in partnership with others, they live in commune with our law firm. Clients don't have to use them, but it's available to them. 
And the reason for that is if the problem is not just legal, sometimes it's a consultant working with our lawyer. Sometimes we're embedded inside this communications platform. And then from that, a legal issue emerges. But usually it's not doesn't come in as a legal issue. It comes in as a consulting issue and then turns into could be law, et cetera. So we're, we, we, have, we are advisors to the companies. We're embedded inside. Whatever the problems are also our problems. How we solve it depends on different people that are involved in our ecosystem. I mean, you're aware of many hats, right? And the ability to constantly pivot. And we're going to come back to that theme in a minute because I think that's that, that's constant through everything that you're doing. And the other thing that you're doing I want to talk about because we think about this a lot too is not just innovation in the, in the business world and in the corporate sector, but in the civic world, right? Mm -hmm. and, and in social impact. So um, can we talk for a minute about the, the social and civic work you do around Germination Project? And that has a lot of different things happening too. So I, I'd love to tell folks a little bit about that. Well, Germination Project, and in the simplest term is a convening platform where leaders converge. So it's not a leadership platform that teaches you how to be a leader. It's not a program that tells you this is our initiative and we want you to work on this. What it is is it's a platform. And what the way we do it is there are four arms to that, four branches to that trunk. It was founded in 2014 uh, to view Philadelphia into the future as, and to look back and say, Many of our social and civic issues did not happen overnight. It was 80 years in the making, for the most part, 60 to 80 years. This, these are endemic challenges. And the only way we're going to solve these are to have a long-term leadership incubator where people take a long-term approach to reversing the 80-year endemic challenge and being open to the, sponta the spontaneous or the un so the you know, the Eastern philosophy, when I stop thinking, I become, do we need to fertilize the same soil the same way? Should we even cultivate the same? So we want those farmers to re-engineer our soil to make it more productive, fertile for everybody in Philadelphia. So how do we do that? Uh, we have four arms. One is the fellowship. The fellowship is every year uh, we take the best and the brightest 10th graders in our region. It's highly competitive. Applications come in. Out of that, maybe 70 or so kids get an interview, a brutal interview process. And from that, maybe 15 to 20 kids get a fellowship. That fellowship lasts for life. It's not a high school, it's not college. Once you're a fellow, you're a fellow for life. Each year, a new cohort comes in. So now we have about 162 fellows. Uh, our original fellows from 2015 class have already graduated, they're in the workforce, and they're doing wonderful things. But it's a platform where those leaders converge and collaborate over a span of life and with passion uh, about something that they care about, uh, lasting perhaps even beyond their lifespan. The second branch out of that Germination Fellowship is called the ARC. The ARC Institute was created in 2020 when the pandemic hit. And the idea behind the ARC was uh, that there'll be another flood and we should build an ARC. Uh, that this crisis, what can we learn from this pandemic? How do we prepare for the next crisis, regardless of what the crisis is? And if you look at the board of the ARC, it's all of the leaders who led the pandemic response for the major institutions, whether it's Penn Medicine or Virtua and others, they're the ones you know, we're learning from and preparing for the next, up, uh, next crisis. The third uh, leg is called Vision 20, 2020. There we said, rather than having this 50 year bet, that's the impatience, why not if we ask 20 of our most prominent leaders in our region, adults, uh, who already have titles and resources and wherewithal and say get together for one year and tackle a big challenge not as a think tank not why tell us why the roof is leaking but instead who's going to grab the bucket who's going to go up to the roof who's going to clear the gutter 20 things small or big can we do that just to sort of create a new zeitgeist of how we tackle problems so first year was last year and we tackled uh, health inequity. And it's who's who in the health space who are members of the 20. Second year, we haven't announced yet, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but it'll be another big topic and 20 prominent names will work for a year in, 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 in collaborating that way. The, the, so that's the, the third leg. And the fourth is the, called the 10 program, which is really dear to my heart. The 10 program is a one year journey for people to go inward. It's a search for inner truth, to discover your own leadership style. 
you know, how do you manage your emotions, physical and spiritual? You know, if, if it's a stick shift, you know, it's learning how to sort of manage your own leadership, discover your own truth and the journey of leadership. That's a one year immersive kind of structured program of self-discovery, a, a guided meditation, if you will, to discover your inner leader. I love that. This is incredible. I mean, so you've got all of these, these four projects that have this common thread of thinking about how we leverage maybe the best thing we have in Philadelphia, which is our people, right? Our best people to change the city for, for good. Um, and I love that because we need it. Philadelphia is a great city. We don't get enough credit, right? Yeah. So um, really fantastic. I, I, and I think the theme of innovation has run through everything you've done and everything you've talked about. And you're now, through the Germination Project, you're empowering the next group of the 10th graders to take innovation and run with it. You're giving the tools and really just giving the partnership to the folks in Vision 20, the, the, the platform to get together and to be partners. So I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, so we started with your philosophy on leadership and we talked about the Western and the Eastern and the African mm -hmm. perspectives. Um, you've talked a little bit about the thread, how that pulls through everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. Anything we missed there that you want to touch on? No, I mean, I think I'm definitely, look, I'm, I'm very proud of Philadelphia's history. Um, uh, and clearly, we have an amazing past. We wrote the code of conduct for the modern world. A democracy was born here, the modern democracy. But if we're merely a mausoleum of uh, great things of the past, then we'll just be a museum. I think we should be a factory where future is being invented. And you're seeing that at Penn Medicine and Biotech and Life Sciences. So. There is a bent and a bias that I have towards not just respecting and, a, a, and, a, and acknowledging our past, which I'm very proud of, but then also being more focused on where the future is going. You know, a preacher man once told me, you can get uh, honey from a honeybee. Uh, you can even get stung by a stinging bee, but you can't get shit from a used to be. And I don't want to be a city that used to be. I want us to be a city that is propelling forward. Forgive me for cursing. I love that. I love that. It's great. Um, you know, there's also a really a, a common theme through everything you do is community too. And I love that. And that, again, goes back to your idea of the African side of we, right? And that creating community. So I think that's really powerful because everything that happens in innovation is collaboration based, right? And it's all about bringing in perspectives and making sure you have all of the perspectives. So that's something that you've done so beautifully. So you do all of these things, right? You're a venture capitalist, you're a lawyer, uh, you're a philanthropist. How in the world, you can't be good at everything. I mean, maybe you are, <laughs> I'm sure you are, but how do you do it? What is your, like, how do you aim and how do you think about approaching all of these things? What's the formula? So if you had asked me this a decade ago, out of insecurity, I would have said, I am good at a lot of these things and I would have been more defensive. Since then, I've acknowledged what my weaknesses are, what I'm not good at. And I think I now know what I think I'm good at. I, here are my, what I believe to be my strengths. I have a native curiosity for what's beyond the horizon. And that's genuine. I'm curious about how the, what's around the corner, what's going to happen in the future. So I do a lot of study on that just because I'm thinking constantly about that. That's just native curiosity. Number two, I'm folksy. I'm a storyteller. And so I have the ability to sort of say, I think we're going to be going over there. This is what's going to happen. And over the years, I've been able to be a magnet for real talent to come in and join forces and say, I know you don't have that talent, but I can fix it. Let's do it together. So the ability to bring real talent. Um, those are the only two strengths that I think I have. So my role over time, I realized, I think I'm more of a P.T. Barnum-like character who's a storyteller, uh, but I'm not the bearded lady. I'm not the strong man, but I do have friends who can juggle on command. And my job is really simple, sell the ticket, to the tent, because inside the tent, I'm convinced that the greatest show on earth is happening. So once you have that, then the, then the question becomes, well, who are your partners? You better have the strongest man. You better have the best bearded lady. You better have the best uh, jugglers on command. And if you have the best acrobats, now it is a, the greatest show on earth. And so the, it's, if you look at all of our platforms, we have a law firm run by really smart lawyers. And our nine law firm partnerships, they're all great law firms that we're partners with, are Venture fund, I don't know how to read a balance sheet, but Rudy Carson sure does, you know, uh, and my other partners sure do. 
Um, any one of our platforms that you look at, really nationally, globally renowned people are the partners who actually run, and that's their expertise and knowledge. We're just part of that village where they come in. And because I'm a blank canvas, I'm more of the asking questions that they probably can't answer because of their knowledge and experience. And I ask the two-year-old, I provide the two-year-old perspective of a blank canvas. I love that. Curiosity is one of the things we teach, right? We teach creative mindset and we teach how to be innovators. We teach curiosity because that's something that if you lose it, you're in trouble, right? So I, I, I'd, I'd posit you're bringing some of the most important things to the table here. Um, so, so last question, if, if you were to leave the folks who are sitting here trying to whiteboard their futures, trying to imagine what they're going to do next, which is hard to figure out when you're in college, right? When you're, you're a young person, um, what, what advice would you leave them with or what nugget would you leave them with? Uh, good question. I would say question your place in the bubble, pierce it, create a new bubble. Love it. You got it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Philadelphia's own P.T. Barnum, <laughs> A.J. Raju. Thank you so That's much. That's an insult to P.T. Barnum, but yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank this you. Thank great. you for this honor. Uh, yeah, we, we really appreciate folk. you taking it. Thank you.